I'm David Levin, and welcome to another episode of Pop Goes the Culture, the untold behind-the-scenes stories of your favorite TV shows from the people who were there. Today, part two of my conversation with the legendary creator of Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, Sherwood Schwartz. This time, we're continuing his story about leaving Bob Hope and Hope's lesson to Schwartz, the blessing of the curse of a comedy writer, how the TV industry typecasts producers, the international fame and the timelessness of Gilligan's Island. He also talks about the mosquitoes, remember them? Plus, you'll learn the origins of the Gilligan's Island theme song, how that li silly little ditty sold the network on the show, even when the original pilot didn't. First, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode, and help us out by becoming a Patreon subscriber. For just a buck a month, you'll get name-checked on at least one Pop Goes the Culture episode. It's a great way to let people think you're famous and keep us on the air. Now, here's the late, great Sherwood Schwartz. I left the show and I went to do Ozzie and Harriet. And, but I'm, I'm we're trying to make a different point to begin with. I, I, I find myself wandering off into different points. But you asked whether that he said to me, he gave me great advice. Well, he gave me this kind of advice. We were in a, in a, in a room after a preview and the, the right, whole writing staff was six, seven of us, and Bob, and we received a visit from the, uh, I forget, I think he was, he was with the ad agency. And he came in to talk to Bob, which was foolish for him to start a discussion with six other guys there. And he said to Bob, hey, look, you're number one, which he was. He said, now that you're number one, you just can't keep doing just jokes all the time. He says, you have to develop a, a character. And he said, like Jack Benny. Jack Benny isn't like that, but into the audience, he's a character. He's a stingy guy. He says, so you have to develop a character because this is a flash in the pan, just jokes. And Bob, who was a big husky guy, especially in those years, he grabbed this guy by the collar of his uh, jacket and he pushed him against the wall. He said, you hired me to do jokes. That's what I do for a living. I do jokes, I'm a comic. If you want somebody else, get somebody else. But I know what I can do and I know what I shouldn't do. He said, I want you to leave now and never come back. And the guy left and never came back. And Bob Hope continued to do jokes for the next 60 years. <laughs> so you have to know what you can do in this world. And that was a lesson. You asked me what kind of lesson. That was an object lesson in what you should do. So, and I found that out the hard way. Now I write comedy. And I once, about 15 years ago, I wrote a very serious script on a very serious topic. And I thought it was a very good script. So I knew a producer who did serious kind of show, shows. And so I gave him the script to read and I said I'd like to have lunch with him and discuss the script. So uh, a couple of days later he calls and I said fine, I'll meet him for lunch. And he was uneasy. And I didn't know exactly why. I said, if you don't like this chip, that's okay. He said, that's not the point. He said, Sherwood, I know you can write funnier than this. <laughs> well, you know, my name is a blessing and a curse because people who know me and want me to do comedy, I'm no problem. But you get, you know, just like actors get typed. Producers, writers get typed. So he resent, did, didn't, wasn't looking for anything except comedy because my name was on the script. So we do get typed. Don't peek poke your pigeonhole. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bad pigeonhole to be in, but, but it limits what, what's acceptable coming from you. Change the name. Get yourself a, like Stephen King used to write under yeah. a different name. Yeah, I thought of that, but then I said, what the heck, if that's, if that's what I'm known by, I might as well take advantage of people who know I can do that. Why, you know, why hit a stone wall? So what, so you did Ozzie and Harriet for a yes. 
um, and, and what happened after that? How did you move into television? Well, when television came along, I did a show uh, called uh, I Married Joan mm -hmm. with Joan Davis, that's her name. And that's when I first worked with, with uh, Jim Backus, who I worked with many times after that. He became the millionaire on, on uh, a show I wrote called Gilligan's Island. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. No. Most people have. No. <laughs> <laughs> One day I went to the mailbox, this is some months ago, and there was a letter from Santiago, Chile. It was one from uh, Norway and one from, there were four different countries, Australia and some other country, all in the same mail, all telling how, how they loved Gilligan's Island. And that's really a great reward. You, you, I had the pleasure I have the pleasure because fan mail continues to, to come in from people who find enjoyment in my work. It's a great show. It stands the test of time. You know, you have these people in this place and there's nothing really sort of to make it of a certain time and place. It could be any time and place. True. It's, you show me another, call, another, another show that has no phone calls in it. Right. There was no phones. There was no cars. There's nothing to date it. It's, it's a removed place. Here's an interesting thing, though, about the show, and this is the only thing that could put it in sort of a time and place. You had an episode in which the mosquitoes came yeah. on the show. Talk about that, because it was the 60s, and there was sort of the Beatles thing. You want to talk about that episode a little bit? Sure. Sure, I'm willing to talk about any of the episodes that I remember, but I've written so much, I, <laughs> I, I forget a lot of the stuff I've written. That's one of my favorite ones. Yeah, well... A lot of people, most people's favorite. I know what, oh, the fan mail. I know who likes the most. The, the one with uh, Phil Silvers was most people's favorite. That we did Hamlet, set the music, which was really a remarkable show. But about your show, the one you like the best. And there is a variance, even though there's preponderance uh, favoring that other, the show with Phil Silvers. Uh, this was our version of the Beatles, just a group, uh, and, and the ladies formed their own group. And so it was a battle of the sexes on, on the island about who could be the, the better group, the, the women or the men. And that was very enjoyable, but it was a different kind of a show for us to do. It was a musical show. Uh, the, the guys who played the Mosquitoes, do you want to talk about that? I know it was, for the folks who don't know, that was, they were played by the Wellingtons who did the theme? The Wellingtons who did the theme song. And uh, that was an interesting story too. The, the Wellingtons, because I wrote the theme because CBS didn't understand what I was talking about because I felt that the, the music was very, very important. Not the music, but the, the fact that you could avoid exposition. I had big battles with Jim Aubrey, who was the head of, of uh, programming for CBS and he said you can't do this show because every week you have to explain what these seven people are doing why are they there on this island and I used to say to him Jim that's you can avoid that the exposition because I mean I believe and I this is a, a, a truth that I tell other people that exposition is the enemy of entertainment once you have to explain what this is all about, you've lost the audience. So I knew what he was driving at, but I said a song could be written that's entertaining and also would do away with any exposition. The song would tell you why these seven people are on the island. He never understood it. And then one day, there was a, a meeting with the East Coast, CBS and the West Coast, big meeting, like 25 people, and all vice presidents of something or other. And I was given 20 minutes, that's what you had, 20 minutes to live or die with your pilot. And you could have been working on it for five years or whatever, but you had 20 minutes to say, why should they expend all this money? And it's tough. And I was not as experienced in those years, and, but I, I had to face this. And the night before, my agent, Perry Leff, called me and said, look, you've been battling with Jim about this the music, 
He said, he doesn't understand what you're talking about. So if you want to make him understand, you better have the song. This was a, a Monday night, he called me. My appointment was Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Where was I going to find a songwriter? I had friends who were in music, but and who's going to, how can I explain to them what's in my head uh, uh, about exposition? So I, I have a piano, and I am somewhat musical. I used to play the violin when I was a kid. And so I went to my piano, and I tapped out what was popular that year was, was uh, um, No, it sounds, it seems like an hour, but I was just away. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> okay, I'm back again. And Calypso was very hot in those years. Uh, and so I decided, you know, what the hell, I knew nothing about Calypso, but I knew the rhythm of it. And I decided since that was popular, I would write a Calypso song. So I wrote the lyrics, what is substantially now the lyrics, but not not Calypso, it's now a kind of a, 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 a sea chanty melody written by, I mean, the, the, the music was by a friend of mine who was a good musician, and he suggested that, that mode. And so I, I came to this meeting the next morning to explain what I meant by the song, and as soon as I opened my mouth, Jim said, look, we keep arguing about it. We've been arguing for, for a month. Actually, it was two months. But it was now, I had to, I was given 20 minutes now to convince him. That's it for now on the next Pop Goes the Culture. Sherwood Schwartz wraps up his story about the network meeting that sold Gilligan's Island through music. Plus, you'll never guess who wrote the incidental music for the show. Schwartz reveals the original actors he wanted to cast in the roles. And he reminisces about Alan Hale and Bob Denver. Till then, who is your favorite Gilligan's Island guest star? Let us know in the comments, and we'll see you next time.